All right, next up on the PlayStation product holiday roadmap is the PlayStation Portal, a strictly remote play player device for PlayStation 5. Uh, we'll do an unboxing, some general comparisons, and some very early impressions on what it's like to use this device. So let's take a look at what's inside, which is not a whole lot. Another USB-C to USB-C cable, which they started doing with the PlayStation 5 Slim CFI 2015. Portal's right there, and looks like we do have some documentation on the bottom underneath this cardboard. But this is what we're here for. Giving us some quick instructions on the buttons and what to do to get this thing going. Upon starting the PlayStation Portal, you'll go through an initial setup wizard, selecting your language, and then selecting a network to connect online. The Portal does need a software update, version 2.0, which apparently is the update that carries the primary function of this handheld, so you'll of course need that. Funnily enough, you'll also have separate updates for the controller software and PlayStation Link. So there's seemingly three different software layers all talking together here for each part of the portal to work properly, rather than Sony at least hiding this behind a single update screen or a software stack that makes one update for all pieces. So while that's installing, some brief size comparisons, which the only thing I don't have on hand right now is the Steam Deck, but what's funny is that the Steam Deck sort of uh, general length is about the same. Of course, profile is going to be a bit different in terms of like where there's empty space and whatnot, but a Steam Deck is about the same size, uh, very similar. But if we look at other PlayStation products, which in this case is simply uh, local play for a PlayStation Vita, I mean, you can get an idea. It fits completely into the 8-inch uh, LCD screen size of the uh, portal because this is only five inches from the actual screen on uh, an original OLED PS Vita, but <clears throat> something else would be well <laughs> more of an Apple product But I mean if we're talking about strictly remote play devices Then the backbone has always been sort of a de facto option for a lot of people um, I've actually come around to this a lot recently where I've played a handful of games on here willingly <laughs> So it's it's uh, certainly a it's it's a viable option, right? But you can see how even that we're talking about something where the screen size alone a lot bigger the comfort level with what is basically a dual sense cut in half. That's the um, the real appeal to a device like this. Also, we have an OLED switch here, which is um, <clears throat> a bit smaller in terms of screen size, right? You're talking about, uh, what is this, roughly seven something inches versus the eight inch LCD on the portal. Outside of the more obvious front facing buttons, the top right has your volume up, volume down, on the left, there's your power, sleep, wake button, and a PlayStation Link button. On the bottom of the portal, discreetly out of view, is the headphone jack and a USB-C port. With the firmware updates now finished, you'll sign into the PSN ID you'll primarily use for this, and then select a PS5 console you've signed into with that ID. Worth noting that during this entire setup process, the portal does have its own unique ambient tone that plays. Anyway, once you're ready to connect, you'll see the portal's very appropriate and flashy animation for when you successfully access your PS5. This will play every time you connect to the console, and the screen prior to connecting is pretty much all the portal has when it comes to its own home screen without a PS5. You will notice in the top right there's the signal strength, battery level, time, and an options icon. This is important because that's the portal's options menu, not to be confused with the options button on the controller. That's only for the remote PS5. You can tap that icon or do a swipe gesture down and away from it to bring up the portal's options. If you're already in a remote play session, you can tap the screen to reveal the icon or do the swipe gesture. For the portal sidebar, you have a connect disconnect option for the console and compatible PlayStation Link headphones. Then there's brightness, an airplane mode, and settings. 
Inside settings, you'll see a few more things you can configure, like your network. That's self-explanatory. Display and brightness lets you adjust brightness for not just the screen, but also the light bars and the mute button, which is really just an on-off toggle. There's no granular options. Under controller, we can set the intensity for haptic feedback and adaptive triggers. Inside system, you can view the device info, manually check for updates, reset the portal, change language, date and time, or adjust power save settings. Something also of note is that you can select legal notices on the bottom, and that will open up some standard affair, license, health and safety stuff, nothing too crazy there, but some of these menus will bring up a browser that is very closed off from what I tried at least with what little time I had, but perhaps there might be a way to escape the browser at some point. Anyway, back to the portal home screen. A big part of the convenience factor is that the portal is like remote play with your phone. You can just put it to sleep or wake it up. If your PS5 is in rest mode, you can wake the portal, hit the PS button to unlock the first screen, and it will turn on your PS5 automatically. In the few test runs I did, the portal was just a tad slower than my iPhone using the official app when remotely starting the PS5. For whatever reason, the portal seems to stall just a few seconds longer on the controller screen on PS5. Assuming you don't always power down your portal completely, it will be about as quick to connect. Same for if your PS5 is already on. The reconnect process is just a few seconds, but again, slightly faster on iPhone. Either way, it being mostly the same speed gives you that convenience, and now also frees up your phone, if you were previously using that for remote play. All right, playing games on the PlayStation Portal. What is that like? Now, it's early on, so I would like a lot more time with it before giving a final assessment, but I think uh, a safe early conclusion here would be it is quite good when we consider it solving two primary issues, which are unrelated to connection problems and latency. We'll talk about that in a second, but it's one of those things where you either have a good connection or you don't. If you do, great, we can move on to this, which is uh, screen size. <laughs> I do always complain about this, but it's true. You know, remote play is always going to be highly dependent on what you're playing and what kind of screen size you're playing from. You know, any kind of, even larger uh, smartphones nowadays, whatever's on the market, they're still oftentimes way too small for trying to play modern games on it, right? Because you're, you're playing titles that are not natively supported on that small, uh, that small handset. And so uh, for a lot of studios, they're not making games with sub seven inch screen sizes in mind. So when it comes to field of view for characters or UI elements, they just don't translate well to those screens. So I find that for a lot of titles, they look bad. It's a very uncomfortable way to play games. So that's not good. What about remote play for uh, desktop, PC, Mac? Okay, that's great, a bigger screen size, but then it's too big because you can easily notice streaming artifacts. And also at that point, it's like we're talking about, you know, a library of titles that are at least 1080p, but PS4 Pro and up, you know, PS5 in particular, we're talking about games that can have a 4K image quality. So <laughs> with a big screen size, it's like, why do you want to play those games and just have it look, you know, as muddy as it's going to look? Even on a solid connection, you're going to see streaming artifacts with a bigger screen size. The perfect middle ground is like a, a tablet style, about eight inches. Uh, now, tablets are great, but the problem with that is you got to prop them up somewhere. You still need a controller for tactile feedback. I mean, there's no mystery here. We know why this works. We have the Switch. We have the Steam Deck. Those are local devices, but we know why games tend to look quite nice on those screens. So that's what's being solved here. The other thing that's being solved, though, which I find it does a better job than the Switch and Steam Deck, is the controller and the, the comfortability. I mean, Sony, I mean, as silly as it looks, it's not like it's a, a broken way to approach it. The DualSense is by and large, one of the best controllers we've had in the games business. It's a very comfortable, nice controller. So yeah, cut it in half, stick a screen in the middle. It may look silly, but the thing is, it is very much off the shelf parts. It is a DualSense literally <laughs> cut in half. The only thing is like, 
you know, by the time you get closer to the center, it is like newer parts with like these trim pieces right here. And funnily enough, uh, looking at the sticks, I was curious. I was like, oh, are they taking these off of uh, PSVR 2 controllers? They're not. So it's actually a new stick as well. It's slightly smaller, uh, smaller than a DualSense, but a little bit larger than PSVR 2 sticks. So that is new there, but just the right size, I find. Also, another like very particular thing that I noticed is that uh, it does still have the... Uh, grip that we all know on a dual sense which is thousands of tiny playstation buttons but they also uh sort of fade out and into an even smooth surface on the back of the device like a real dual sense as well so you pick this up and outside of also like experiencing haptic feedback and adaptive triggers it just it feels incredibly familiar and then the other thing is that the design of the playstation portal it still looks very silly with, I guess, this open space right here, right? How it looks like it's floating and that's where the whole dual sense cut in half tablet in the middle shtick is coming from. Uh, but you know what? <laughs> Even though I still think it would, I guess, appearance wise look better with that space filled in, you know, you pick it up, it's functional. The reason why it's functional is because it's a controller, right? So your fingers still wrap around to the point where they're going past the display. Well, for me at least, it depends on you know who you're talking to. But I think for a lot of folks, that actually is something where you don't realize it until you pick this thing up and you go, oh, okay, I, I guess I see now why that, that space is opened up. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that, that's something where I've kind of taken a U-turn on that because you, you pick it up and you realize, oh, okay, well, may, maybe that's why that space is, is open on, <laughs> on, the, uh, on the PlayStation portal there. Now, let's move on to the, the latency, right? Because... Uh, this is something where your mileage is going to vary. So, you know, with that, Sony says you want at least five megabits per second, but 15 is ideal and recommended. Uh, so for me, comparing it to any other time I've ever done remote play, I really did not notice much of a difference, which means, you know, that's kind of a good and bad thing, right? You kind of hope that the portal, which is a purpose-built device, has uh, some kind of onboard hardware that at least sort of uh, tries to reduce that latency as much as possible and maybe that is still the case but I'm finding that it seems about the same which is that for a lot of software varied genres it's totally serviceable playable on a good stable connection uh, I did try Returnal and go through a run there and that's kind of my benchmark for like okay this is a very twitchy fast paced shooter with a lot of precision uh, right and so I yeah that's where like the latency becomes a lot more noticeable same for something like Luminous right I, I can't really play Luminous over re remote play that's still not really changing here so you know as long as you're playing something that has I guess more leeway then you're, you're gonna be fine just as a sort of like not scientific way to look at this right so again didn't really have uh, much time to really dive super deep into the the latency aspect but my initial thought is it feels very similar to most other times I've attempted remote play on my home network although I will say I did eventually run into some hiccups uh, throughout the day which I mean that's something where my download has always been good but it's my upload which is a problem on the PlayStation 5 itself if the upload starts dipping you know below Sony's recommendation then the image that it's sending to the portal that's where it's not going to look very good so I ran into a number of issues when my home network was facing congestion which uh, does tend to happen around certain times it's really finicky but uh, that's just you know a consequence of a, a device like this now I did also try using a Bluetooth adapter because the one thing Sony is not letting you do is use your own Bluetooth headphones for this device, which obviously is a huge pain, right? They've got their own new wireless protocol called PlayStation Link that they're going to use for the Pulse Explorer and the Pulse Elite, and uh, that's all well and good. And there might be a reason for that because when using the third-party Bluetooth adapter, I think this was kind of expected, uh, but yeah, that was just... <laughs> Not a very good experience, a lot of latency, really poor. Uh, I did connect my AirPods, which the ceiling for the, the volume was like really low. You could not get it to sound that loud at all. Uh, I tried to record it, but it just, it was not getting picked up and it does still play when they're out of my ears, but uh, something where, yeah, it was just latency, not loud enough. 
also the wireless receiver has like a separate four hour battery life you're just you're adding all these complications to uh, an equation that just amounts to a really bad experience so uh, unsurprisingly I think this might be something where while it does suck that they're not supporting Bluetooth headphones uh, standard maybe given the scenario of this device being a remote play device where it's taking in this video signal and a you know a sound source right and it's trying to beam that um, out of this uh, screen where everything is all <laughs> timed up evenly so maybe there is a certain level of that's why they're doing a new wireless protocol that uh, requires new headphones it's obviously not great for the consumer um, and I'd like to think that that's why they're doing it it's not simply a matter of hey buy our new headphones but um, if I had a guess I'd say that is playing a bit of a role there so it, it might not be nearly as easy to support all these separate third-party wireless headphones where uh, the mileage is going to vary widely on the, the latency given the you know given what this device is doing but anyway that's um, you know that that's what happens if you do use a, uh, a Bluetooth adapter now in terms of the onboard speakers those get really loud uh, but at full volume it has a, a tinniness to it right so it doesn't sound it's not bad but it's just something where at full volume and, and certainly if you're uh, if you do run into the occasional uh, connection hiccup then it's just that's gonna sound really poor so I, I would recommend against uh, blasting this thing but if you do want to have it at a you know 60 70 percent volume then that's going to serve you just just fine going through your games Now, something else that came up, which was not a deal breaker because this comes up with any remote play device for PlayStation, that's you know what they do with on-screen touchpad controls. So in this case, you've got a touchpad on the far right and the far left of the portal, so you can access it uh, from either side. And uh, just something where, you know, for a lot of games, they usually use the touchpad for uh, the start menu or just accessing certain menus. Sometimes there are swipe gestures uh, that you can do for a, a select few games. And using that on the portal is just annoying, if only because uh, how raised up the controller is from the display, it, it actually falls down quite a bit from you know your your reach so when you're going down to swipe or press the touchpad not only do you have to hit it enough times for it to register uh, but it's just it's kind of far and so it's a little bit uncomfortable to where you have to readjust your hand uh, something where if you keep doing it over and over again it gets old really quick um, so you know it's something where every time you want to hit start for certain games like you're, you're gonna be doing that right so uh, kind of a pain but thought that was worth mentioning as well now again, not really trying to make this a final review, but for now, the initial review, I, I guess we could say, would be that if you're on the fence, uh, you know, I would actually argue this probably would work well for a lot of people, even outside of that very niche use case that many are you know, proposing with this thing, which is the obvious like, oh, if you've got kids and they're using up the TV, you can play PS5 games that way. If you're very busy and you only have an hour before bed, that's a great way to get some time in, right? I mean, it, it's always been billed as a very niche device and it still is, but I would really say it might stretch a bit outside of that. It, it, it's still a great way to play games if you do have a good connection uh, that is reliable, right? You can easily test this without making the investment. Try the remote play app on uh, Android, iOS. Um, something I didn't get to test obviously is like the third party apps and again like Steam Deck has an option there as well. So there's more avenues to explore. But if we're talking about remote play, uh, by and large, this is a very nice first-class way to play games uh, via remote play. So I, I think this actually would appeal to a lot more people outside of that use case, but you have to know if it's really going to work for you. So just do some testing beforehand to confirm if your network is, is good and stable enough, that, and then I think you might actually be uh, lined up quite nicely to enjoy the PlayStation Portal. But uh, other than that, that's all I've got for you for now. So. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all in my next video. You take it easy.